It's a pleasure to talk with you. I was I was going over your websites today, and you've got some phenomenal uh, research and and investigations into near death experiences. Can can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in this? Sure. Um, I was a critical care physician uh, for the first part of my career, and uh, I was at the, out of uh, Seattle Children's Hospital. Uh, I worked for um, uh, what's known as Airlift Northwest, and Airlift Northwest is, you know, as, as you might imagine, is an air transport service uh, through, you know, Alaska, uh, Montana, Idaho, uh, Oregon, and to bring critically ill children to Seattle Children's Hospital. So I happened to uh, pick up a young girl uh, in uh, Pocatello, Idaho, and uh, she was a very, very difficult resuscitation. Um, at, uh, several times I thought that uh, she was, uh, in fact, dead, uh, and her, uh, her parents, in fact, had uh, insisted on uh, coming in and uh, praying uh, at her bedside and forming sort of a prayer ring around her which was uh, very inconvenient for us because, uh, of course, you know, we're trying to put all kinds of tubes and lines in her. And But uh, I figured that she was, you know, really, uh, you know, that her demise was going to be within uh, minutes, so I let them. Uh, but to my surprise, uh, she made a full recovery. And as one of these things happens in life, uh, sort of a coincidence, I happened to be uh, out there uh, in Pocatello uh, uh, working uh it, it, doing some residency training in a uh, little clinic there, and she happened to be, uh, she came into that clinic for uh, her follow-up after her successful recovery. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, there's the guy that put a tube in my nose. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was like, well, what? You know, because uh, when I had seen her, of course, uh, you know, she uh, wasn't seeing anything. Uh, her eyes were fixed and dilated and uh, she, uh, you know, so, so, you know, she said, "Well, we tape our eyes closed anyway in those situations because we don't want, you know, dust or dirt to fall in them." But, um, you know, I, I knew that she had not, in fact, <laughs> seen the, me do anything. And she went on to uh, say things like, uh, "Oh, little comments that the nurses has made." And then she said, "Oh, I saw you go over to the phone and you were talking to someone on the phone and you were." Uh, you were sort of shouting at him, saying, uh, well, what am I supposed to do now? Uh, which, in fact, was what I was doing. Because um, <laughs> uh, I sort of, hey, you know, I, I didn't know, you know what to do next in terms of her resuscitation. And uh, she gave a blow-by-blow -blow, uh, details of her own resuscitation. And mm. at the time, I was training to be a neurologist. And interestingly enough, the... Uh, Spiritual aspects of her experience really had very little interest for me. I was mostly interested that she could remember anything, that she mm -hmm. could, in fact, describe her own resuscitation. And the, How the many of these results they studied us? You, you you documented many of these instances. Was it something that, I mean, when when you encountered her story, did it immediately start ringing uh, bells in your head that there's something else out there? Because I, I read a story of yours where you were talking about um, joking with other doctors as, as you were, uh, I believe, performing CPR on a baby or, or, or trying to resuscitate a child. And it, it didn't shock me when I read that because I've got family there in the medical field, and, and it's somewhat common that, um, I, I guess, to make a, a light of the situation or, or to make it easier to accept that a lot of medical professionals end up almost in a very callous nature um, in regards to a situation like that. I mean, it wasn't just this one event. How many do you think overall, before you started going, wait a second, there's something here? Well, it wasn't. Uh, I don't think that was really the sequence. Um, I haven't really uh, thought that there was something here, <laughs> as, as you put it. Uh, that took me many, many years to reach that uh, realization. Uh, that what really uh, interested me uh, first was this concept of uh, that she could retain a memory at all. And so I immediately, I, I was just uh, starting uh, in medicine. I was a uh, you know, resident uh, at the time. Uh, so I was, you know, I wanted to make my mark in the world. And uh, I immediately uh, set out to uh, do a study of these experiences. And at the time, nobody had really studied these experiences in any sort of formal or systematic way. Uh, there was a number of uh, sort of collections of uh, stories in adults. But uh, at Seattle Children's Hospital, 
uh, we decided that uh, we would, uh, well, at, at the time, actually, we thought that an anesthetic agent uh, called halothane uh, caused these experiences. Uh, halothane is known to sort of cause dissociative or out-of-body experiences, and uh, we decided we would uh, study them. So we studied all survivors of cardiac arrest at Seattle Children's Hospital over about 10 years. And then uh, it's over that 10-year period, <laughs> I mean, that, uh, that it just sort of starts creeping up on you. I, mean, I, I, I resuscitated one child. Uh, it was, uh, he was uh, resuscitated in the lobby of uh, Seattle Children's Hospital. He had a cardiac arrest because his pacemaker uh, failed. And so we resuscitated him right in the lobby and got his pacemaker going again. And he opens his eyes and he looks at me and he goes, that was weird. You guys just sucked me back into my body. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, but, you know, I understand this sort of skeptical viewpoint or people that really dismiss these experiences out of hand or are really, you know, that it doesn't resonate with them. Because I had that uh, myself. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's very, very difficult because we're trained, of course, to think that the brain creates consciousness. And uh, I think one advantage that I have, these are by and large patients I resuscitated myself. So I knew for a fact that their brains weren't working. Whereas, you know, when I think when other people, when you read about these stories or, uh, you know, you just really wonder, well, were they really close to death? Or, you know, are they just kind of exaggerating things? Or, you know, or, or if you go through the medical records, it's very hard sometimes to tell if somebody's really near death or not. Whereas uh, <laughs> the boy I was telling you about, you know, I know, you know, he was in full cardiac arrest. Um, I mean, within minutes, uh, he would have been dead. That's why we resuscitated him on the lobby of the, uh, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> children's hospital <laughs> instead of now, taking him to the emergency room. When, when you say they're, they're dead, I mean, I, I, I guess a, a skeptic would say, oh, well, there, there must be some oxygen in the brain. There's still brain activity, but that's not the case. The brain is literally flatlined. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, uh, I'm going to just skip to the end of the story because um, I, I just think that, uh, it, you know, I, I used to mince around like, you, like you're saying, too. Uh, when, when we first published our studies, we would call them clinically dead. Uh, and then we would, uh, you know, we just sort of hem and haw about it because, again, it defies what we're taught. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I went to Johns Hopkins. I mean, you know, the, the, the gods of neurology that I worship say that, you know, the coma wipes clean the slate of consciousness. You know, dead brains don't think, in other words. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. here's the end of the story. I'll just skip right to the end. In the last couple of years, astonishingly enough, um, science has found that there is a resting energy in the brain that far exceeds probably the entire energy output of the brain, uh, you know, uh, during, you know, a conscious uh, life. And so they're, they're really, uh, in the last couple of years, it's been well shown uh, that the dying or dead brain has an enormous amount of uh, resting activity. Um, uh, physicians at uh, George Washington University uh, just recently showed uh, that in the last few seconds of life, there's an enormous amount of coherent brain wave activity measured on EEGs. So uh, I think mm. we just, I mean, I, I don't think anybody feels good about it. I mean, you know, unless you're already very religious. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, but I mean, I'm just saying, you know, medical scientists, we don't feel good about it. But let's face it, it's that these are dead brains and yet they're still conscious and they're awake and they're alert and they're having thoughts and feelings. And more importantly, the uh, feelings they're having are primarily spiritual feelings and the belief that they're learning lessons of love. I, mm. it, you, you know, you can't get around it. That's a scientific statement in the year 2011, is that when we die, we're going to be awake and aware and we're learning lessons of love. Uh, you know, so I, I, I'll, I'll, let me just uh, uh, I'm going to just give you, you know, to show you how solid this science is um, there's a guy named Jim Winery uh, who is a very good friend of mine uh, I worked with him for years and he's a flight surgeon uh, for uh, the National Warfare Institute 
and uh, he inadvertently discovered an experimental model for near-death experiences. They took uh, uh, fighter pilots and they would put them in a centrifuge and whirl them at enormous speeds so they could understand the effect of G-forces on the human brain. And so, uh, you know, of course, uh, he's able to, you know, they can vary their centrifuge runs to, you know, a couple of minutes before theoretical death, you know, right on up to a couple of seconds before theoretical death. And sure enough, his research shows that in the last few seconds of life, really when the brain theoretically should be shutting down, it's not. It's uh, the, you know, those pilots then suddenly become awake and aware, and they think they're out of their uh, body, and they're having a, a whole variety of near-death experiences. And quite frankly, yeah. this is after they've gone into coma. This is after they've had seizures. This is after they've had you know a complete loss of you know. I mean, it's it's, you, know, see, you can't. Yeah, you can't. I don't think anybody can dispute anymore that uh, in the last few minutes of life, oh, well, <laughs> they, you know, a child told me best. She said, I was never so alive. I was never so alive as in the few seconds before I died. That's incredible. <laughs> Let me ask you, you, your perception of Western medicine, you, you, I, I'm reading your work. You seem like you've, you've moved away from the, the traditional constructs of Western medicine. Is that the case, or is Western medicine moving towards the research you're doing? Um, no, I, I think that um, I'm moving away from <laughs> from traditional Western medicine. Um, I, now, I want to say something though that I, you know that I think is important. In no way am I saying that you know so-called Western medicine is wrong. You know, I, I think that the, you know the the new you know understandings that I've had, and frankly, I think anybody involved in this field <laughs> has had. Uh, we're not saying though that you know that pills don't work. You know, of course they work. Um, you know, of course our bodies are biological machines. Of course we can tinker with the biological machine uh, with, you know, various uh, pills and uh, things like that. But having said that, uh, it's far more limited than we ever realized that uh, so much of uh, medicine is in fact, you know, what people loosely call energetic medicine. It's really, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, this idea that, um, <laughs> you know, that we're just a biological machine, uh, it doesn't do uh, justice to what's going on uh, during the human mm -hmm. process. I agree. I and, agree. I, you know, I guess we're just, you know, but it's not, uh, you know, the reason I'm emphasizing this is uh, it, it really irritates me what I consider to be an unhealthy either-or attitude, you know, Either you go see a nature path or, you know, you go see your regular doctor. I mean, I dream of, you know, 20 years from now, you know, all doctors having the same body of information and using it well, the way it's supposed to be. I mean, medicine should be medicine. Uh, you know, mm, but, I agree. Uh, sure, but, you know, <laughs> you know having said that, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, research now in energetic medicine, and it's amazing to me that the sort of built-in uh, prejudices against it, the built-in, you know, this sort of the sweeping and the dismissive, uh, you know. It's oh, somewhat well, dismissed, true. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. Of course it's true. Um, it's, it, you know, well, you know, this might sound like a weird jump to you, but it's not. And I, you know, so I'll fill in the gaps, but I'm going to do the jump first. Um, when I wanted to understand if the near-death experience is real, uh, so one thing that my wife and I uh, learned to do was something called uh, remote viewing. And the remote viewing uh, is the ability to use your mind to see things that are not in your ordinary field of senses. Well, so that's important to me to understand near-death experiences because the near-death experience is what we call a non-local perception. You know, these children are describing another reality that is not, in fact, this reality. Well, so the question comes, well, is that other reality real? You know, are they, is the God that they see a real God? 
Well, you know, and I've been on enough of these debates to know that, you know, that you always have some sort of mean spirited <laughs> materialist guy that only you know it always does seem to be a guy, by the way. You know, he always Absolutely. says, Well, these are just hallucinations in the last few minutes of life and blah blah blah. You know, <laughs> come on. I'm gonna, so let's see, when we die, we hallucinate we're going to heaven and we hallucinate we're learning beautiful stories of love. Uh, of how we could have lived our lives differently uh, if only we had been more loving. Okay, well, sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's no way of arguing with that. You, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? I mean, if someone wants to, you know, that's like saying, well, you know, there's people that don't believe in love, period. You know, that everything in life is an economic exchange, and I don't know. Anyway, so, but this controlled remote viewing did give us a chance to say, well, wait a minute, here's a non-ordinary perception that we can say if it's true or not because, you know, if we're going to see the Eiffel Tower, for example, you know, in Paris, well, then, you know, that's something objective that then we can see if we nailed it or not. Okay. Anyway, so, all right, so uh, my wife and I learned to do that. It turns out it's true. Okay, with that, we do have this ability as human beings. But the point And, and you all actually you know, teach it to the, people, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is, well, that's... Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, you're, uh, you're you're right with me. I'm only so worried if I kind of jump around, but it's yeah. So actually, okay. actually, to, to, to give you some that. background, to give you some background information, uh, we did have Paul Smith on the program. Um, oh, about Paul two Smith months is ago. my teacher. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so but yeah, I'm so we're with you. So just stuff. go ahead and continue. Yeah, I'm going to tell you some stuff then that Paul Smith doesn't even seem to know. It's great, and Paul Smith is the greatest, but. Here's, the, here's sort of the punchline in terms of a physician, someone who's studying near-death experiences, trying to understand this stuff. Okay. Because remember, remember, you know, we were starting to talk about energetic medicine and different ways of healing, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. as, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, got to know uh, Paul Smith and got to know, the, you know, that, that whole culture, it became obvious to me that they have extraordinary abilities, that the United States has, uh, you know, in their psychic spy program, uh, they can do amazing things. And, uh, you, know, uh, t- uh, you know, to not get real coy about it all, uh, but, uh, you know, to not, you know, to, but to not beat around the bush either, uh, the military uh, remote viewers have earned every service award that's available to non-combat, um, you, know, uh, you know, soldiers. Uh, so, and and from two presidents, and from the Secret Service uh, twice. So they're not getting those awards for nothing. And mm-hmm. so, mm-hmm. I'm thinking to myself, though, well, in the in the world of medicine, you know, we have Reiki healers and we have energetic healers and things like that, but they don't really do very much. You know, they're thought to perhaps, uh, oh gosh, you know. Um, you know, you can relieve stress. You can, uh, you know, some, you know, simple things like that. But nobody is is really, you know. And the, of course, you always hear some extraordinary story about someone being, uh, you know, having, a, you know, being cured of cancer uh, by a Reiki uh, therapist. Um, I have a story like that from my own practice. You know, a, a mm. small child that was uh, healed by energetic healing. But my question is, if the you know regular world, the non-military world. If we took this stuff seriously, if we stopped with this dismissive attitude, oh, dead brains can't think. Oh, those just must be hallucinations at the point of death. <laughs> oh, uh, energetic healing—that can't be true. I mean, uh-huh. it doesn't come in a little pill box. Uh, mm-hmm. And you know, then then it can't actually work. You know, as if those pills weren't first, you know, herbs. You know that that you know traditional or you know healers uh, used Absolutely. anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, if we didn't have this attitude, if we had the attitude that Paul Smith has, we'd be using this kind of energetic healing on a regular basis. We would be actually uh, putting this kind of knowledge to work. And I get, you know, that's sort of, you know, my, you know, my soapbox and my beef about it all is that once I learned that near death experiences are real, you know, sort of by the tangential way of learning about remote viewing, you know, to me, remote viewing is a window into the near death experience, you know, to, you know, to sort of just you know, sum that up. Then I'm let wondering. Me ask you. Let me, let yeah. me ask you. Um, 
because you touched upon that, and and I I don't want to take you off your track. So so if you could just make yeah, a mental note of where you're at. Um, I have a question. We, we this is an interactive format how we do the show, and I've got a question from our, our shtf dot com chat. It is a question from a man named Von Hellman, and he wants to know uh, on on these people that have had the near death experiences and see the light, uh, or other dead people on the other side. Um, do you say do you follow up with them, and and how has it affected their lives? And 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 I want to turn that towards you because you're saying that it, it's somewhat with your remote viewing that you you think it's or you know it's similar to a near death experience. So could you kind of touch on how it's impacted those people and yourself, and if you stayed up with them? Absolutely. Uh, let me just uh, you know I just have one more sentence to finish up because you know basically okay. what I was trying to pull together was to just say hey wait a minute if we took the near death experience seriously if we learn these lessons from the light. And if we learn the implications of what this experience is, and if we applied the same discipline and rigor that the United States military has applied to psychical experiences, uh, we would see a revolution in medicine right now. We would, you know, our our, our medical knowledge uh, would increase uh, tenfold. You know, so that's you know, and, and then that does uh, fit very nicely into that question then of the transformation of the near death, um, excuse me, the near death experience. Um, we did, in fact, uh, I, I've studied these, uh, you know, since I studied these children back uh, in the 1990s. Uh, we have continued to study them uh, as years go by. In addition, I did a formal study of adults uh, who had near death experiences as children. And, uh, you know, to look at, you know, whether or not it's really the near-death experience that seems to uh, alter their lives. And in a nutshell, it does. And what they mm. learn from this experience is to be nice, <laughs> to be nice people. You know, uh, you know, people that have had the near-death experience, uh, first of all, their spirituality is very different than the spirituality than uh <laughs> that I sort of see, uh, you know, you know, when I look around in the population. They, uh, by and large, people have had near-death experiences. They see this life as the spiritual life. That we're supposed to learn something here, and primarily we're learning lessons of love, of how to love each other. So that's that's the the, the main thing, and that they're not all about then wanting to leave their body. And, you know, have out-of-body experiences and things like that. Uh, One child told me best. She said that life is for living and the light is for later. So they, you know, they they have that, you know, they've come back with a sense of purpose. But the purpose is to live this life. Or, you know, another child told me she said she sees pieces of the light everywhere she goes. She says, oh, I'm waiting in line at the supermarket anymore. Because I know the light is there. I know. I know that around me, you know, uh, I can find it. Uh, you know, so it, it's not. <laughs> they, they, by and large, are not religious when they come back. If they were religious, uh, they don't go to church anymore. Uh, by and large, uh, they. Uh, I wouldn't say they reject anything, but they sort of drop the whole concept of, you know, that, that God is one thing or another. Um, <laughs> And they come back with, uh, well, we documented that they spend more time with their family. Uh, they spend more time uh, giving you know, money to charity. Uh, they temp- typically work in helping professions. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they spend more time in simple things like uh, meditation. Uh, so and the transformation, the mystery of life, the secret of life is, is actually pretty simple. It's, you know, be a nice person, get along with your neighbor, try to be a loving person. And they don't come back with, you know, wanting to, you know, find, found some church or, you know, proselytize to everybody at all. Not in, not in the least. You know, so it's kind of ironic. You know, these are people who have actually seen who, you know, God or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever God is. There's no doubt that, the, you know, these are people who actually see, you know, God. And yet they don't come back and then want to set up a church and teach everybody about God. <laughs> and that's good. That, that's that good. You something right there. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It does, at least to me, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, well, I'll tell you. I'll just tell you one quick story. It was, um, you know, no, this please. is a formal study that I did. Uh, I did a formal study of, 
you know, the adults that had near-death experiences as children. So, of course, they have to fill out a questionnaire and, you know, all this kind of stuff. You have to fill out, you know, their address and what their occupation is and everything. So uh, this young man, is probably in his early 20s, he says to me um, that he was sent back. Um, well, his, his experience was really funny, too. He was floating out of his body, and then he didn't know how he was going to get back in his body. So he had a terrible oh moment of panic. Yeah, he, you, know, you know, people always talk about these experiences being so beautiful and everything, but uh, weird is what children describe him as. And, and he said he had no idea how he was going to get back in his body, and he became very frightened and very upset. Um, but then finally a voice seemed to say to him, go back, Bobby, you have a job to do. And almost mm. picked him up by, like, the scruff of his neck and, and threw him back to his body or, you know, is what he perceived it as already. So, mm. okay. So, so all right, so this is, you know, this is kind of early in my career, too, and I was a little more cynical about all this stuff. I was, like, thinking, oh, great, this is going to be the one. You know, he's sent back to, you know, to, I don't know, you know, to find a cure for cancer or whatever. So I, I was like, I looked at him, and I, you know, I was practically rolling my eyes. I was like, okay, you know, so what was your job? What were you sent back for? He looks at me, and he says, you know what my job is. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? I mean, come on, you just said you were sent back from heaven to do a job. He said, yeah, I told you I run a little construction company. You know, I got those numb nuts working for me, and if it weren't for me, those guys would never find a job. They, nobody would hire them. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that was his whole perception. He was sent back to run this tiny, you know, he had like four or five you know, of his high school friends that worked for him. Huh. <laughs> and that's, that's a incredible. very, very uh, typical attitude of people who've had near-death experiences. You know, they feel that their ordinary lives are filled with purpose. I'll, well, I'll tell you another quick one. Just uh, you know, I'll just I'll just tell you really quick because this is a really important concept. Is that please? You know, when people are struggling to understand all this, they um, that's the clock in my house. But um, you know, this one guy he said to me that he knows his life is important. So I said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, I don't know. Maybe my life isn't important. But maybe I'll talk to somebody, and then they'll do something, and then I'll cause somebody else to do something important. Or maybe it'll just be I'm walking across the street one day, and a car will slow down, and that'll do something so that someone else doesn't get run over. <laughs> mm. yeah. So they have this sense of this greater interconnectedness, and yet you know they feel their lives are important. They don't have a sense like... You know, like the rest of us, and you know, we're all just you know dung beetles on Earth that are just mm -hmm. going to die. And there's you know five billion of us, and and what does it matter if you know if if we live or die? That is not their attitude. They almost it almost sounds like they have a when they come back they have almost a butterfly type effect uh, feeling about themselves. They're not looking to to change the world single handedly. They're just looking to to give a nudge almost. Would would you say that's correct? Absolutely. That is mm -hmm. uh, well said. That's perfectly uh, – that uh, it makes me wonder if you've had a near-death experience. That's just the kind of thing that they say. <laughs> Precisely. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, they talk that all of life is interconnected, um, that, that life is one big pattern, uh, and that anything that one person do, does is just going to sort of vibrate through the whole you know, network. You know, that mm -hmm. it's all one big – you know, well, they talk a lot. You had Paul Smith on your show. Um, they talk a lot like Paul Smith, you know, that sort of concept that, that and this is all just a big matrix and uh, that, you know, everything is all connected for a reason. And in this world, we don't know what the reason is, but, um, that you know, when they're in that moment, they feel they know everything. Mm -hmm. They feel that they have, you know, a sense of complete knowledge, um, I, which is, Paul, of course, Paul was great, you know, by the way. Yeah. Probably. Well, that's why, okay. see, that's why I, you know, that's why I say that the near-death experience, that the control room of viewing is a window into the experience, because if it's true that, you know, that during the near-death experience you enter into this state of all knowledge, well, then it makes sense that somebody who's interested in, a, you know, a, a military target across the world could come back with that piece of knowledge. I mean, you know, that, uh, you know, that all the knowledge is there and that you can come out with whatever knowledge you feel is going to be useful to you. Mm -hmm. Now, and I think that's correct. 
we've got we've got an hour left uh, of the show time, and I want to ask you right now. I, you know, I, I've got a list of questions I want to get through, but at the same time, your stories in in and of themselves are are absolutely incredible. Um, I'm asking you right now to consider coming back on the show at some future date, because oh, I, I, I could. I'd love to I could do a whole show listening to you on, on your stories. They're just incredible. Um, <laughs> well, let me hear those questions, though, because really, you know, I'm going to tell you what my motivation is. Um, my motivation is a real simple one. I consider myself to be incredibly blessed and incredibly lucky. A very a few, I, really, if anybody, you know, that these are children that by and large I resuscitated myself. I was able to hear their stories for the first time. And, and 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 then as a physician, so that just you know all of, you know when I read about near death experiences in the media or you know I see stuff on TV etc. I just want to put my head in my hands or or some of these overly skeptical people, you know I see you know even even to my videos you know sometimes uh, you know my I have some videos on YouTube and these people write in these comments I just want to hug them because <laughs> you know. I can well I can understand. I can understand if I hadn't, you know, if I didn't resuscitate these children, if I didn't know that they were in fact dead, then I would be wondering about this whole deal too, you know, is it, you know, mm-hmm. somebody exaggerating the medical records or they And and there's aspects to the experience that here I, let me I'll give you a story to illustrate what I'm saying. Is uh I Please. resuscitated this young girl and we had to put a needle in her heart to restore mm. her heart. Okay, so that's you know that's near death. <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, no, absolutely. That's, you know, that's not just near death. That's like that's um, you know, uh, Well, in you know, in 15 years of you know being a critical care physician, <laughs> that only happened once that it actually worked. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, so and so she comes and so she tells me her story. And her story is that she can't remember anything about being in the hospital. She doesn't remember why she was in the hospital in the first place. Okay, well, that fits with conventional, you know, neurology, that she's lost her short-term memory. So then she has this one isolated uh, experience. And this experience is that she says, while, while I heard you asking for that crash cart thing, and the nurses were running around, and you were telling them you needed something, you know, then, you know, so she local, you know, she mm. localizes when this happened to her. She says that she saw her grandmother sitting in a chair. And then she says, and I was back. So I said to her, well, what do you mean you're back? And she clenches her, her hands and she goes, that's what I've been trying to figure out. <laughs> so, wow. Well, she never said that again. She never said that again. I never heard her say that again. You know, by the time she said, you know, just charged from the hospital and she's home and now she's told her story, you know, and, you know, she's told her story on TV. You know, now it's the the, the typical story. She went into a room. There was all these bright lights. Her grandmother was sitting there, you know. But, you know, and so, and, and, and I think, you know, people quite naturally, they start saying, well, wait a minute. Is everybody just sort of embellishing these stories, et cetera? But they're embellishing them out of the natural urge to try to explain something that's unexplainable. You know, I mean, you know, once they start talking to other people, then of course these stories sort of become homogenized. But I was lucky enough to hear these stories for the first time, and they're not. I mean, they, you know, I mean, she's like, you know, that's what I'm trying to figure out. So if these are just an invention of the mind, she would have made it up right on the spot. I mean, you know, well, well not making it up is the wrong word. We use the term confabulation when, when the brain tries to just paper over a memory gap. It's seamless. You know, I've interviewed many, many patients, uh, you know, that have uh, conditions that cause confabulation, and they seamlessly invent a story right from the start, whereas her story evolved, you know, just from the naturalness of, you know, she's eight years old, and now, you know, everybody's telling her what it really was. Uh, and, you know, but, I mean, it doesn't evolve that much. I mean, she still has, you know, she still says her grandmother was sitting in a chair and was dressed in white, et cetera. But I just, I, I feel it's my responsibility to let people know. Um, and also, you know, all the parents whose children didn't come back. 
you know, I mean, and 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 they're so, and and yet they've had profound spiritual experiences, and and right now in our society the way it is, our society is just like. You know, a spiritual experience is just, you know, a hallucination. It's just it's just your mind trying to deal with grief or, you know, all these kinds of, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. things. That well, we're, we're a society of consumerism and, and materialism. So with, let me ask you, with, with your work... So There's a long way of saying, though, I want to answer your questions. Because I just feel like I have an obligation to answer them. I just, you know, nobody else can Good. answer them. I'll just tell you that much. You know, I don't know that, you know, you know so many of the other researchers are just not... You know, I don't know. Anyway, Pin von Lummel, I think, you know, I mean, there's a handful of us who actually resuscitated our own patients, but not many. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, with these questions, feel free to expand in the stories. I, I, I do want you on again. Uh, I, you've got some mind-blowing stories that I, I'm uh, – I, I shouldn't say stories. I should say experiences, documented experiences. Uh, they're, they're incredible. So as I go through these questions – Feel free to just elaborate and and just let me know when when you're done with that because oh, okay, I'm, sure. I I am just blown away. Uh, your main premise in doing the com- controlled remote viewing, uh, and I, I think I may have missed it, uh, but I, I, I just in a minute if you would, uh, with the controlled remote viewing, does it give you the near death experience? And then on top of that, your purpose in doing the controlled remote viewing is to explore, as you stated, we're doing this com- controlled remote viewing to to figure out military strategic targets and how to kill people, but you're actually looking at how to cure things such as AIDS, hepatitis, uh, potentially see into patients that, that where other doctors can't figure out what's wrong with them and to actually understand from from this this alter the, from within the matrix to understand what's wrong with them. Uh, so you're actually trying to do this stuff to, to create a literal uh, shamanistic uh, practice in the 21st century. Uh, 21st wow! Century yeah. Hey, thanks. <laughs> you know, I've never heard it said that way, but you're right. I, I guess I've never actually considered it as you said, but that's correct. Uh, I believe that a remote viewing ultimately uh, could become a shamanistic experience. That uh, you know, right now, I don't think that um, I don't think we've gotten to that uh, uh, state yet. Um, but uh, you're right. Uh, I think that if, in fact, uh, uh, people really put their mind to it, and if we devoted the kind of resources uh, to medical applications that the military has uh, devoted uh, to, uh, you know, their uh, purposes, intelligence gathering, etc., mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. it could be a, a true shamanistic practice, and uh, we uh, would take medicine up another level. Sure, I agree with that. But tell me. Your question itself, um, I, you know, I, I know I gave a lot of information all at once, so you know, I'm glad to just stop now and sort of go back over it. I don't. The controlled remote viewing is not the near death experience. I don't mean to say that at all. Um, the sequence went for me like this. Uh, first, my first question with near death experiences is when do they occur? And uh, my research, Penn von Lummel's research, everybody's research indicates. Uh, that they, in fact, occur in the last few minutes of life. So that's the first question. Okay. So, um, well, you know, so that, of course, brings up the question of, you know, consciousness and do we need a brain to have consciousness? So, you know, sort of the second question is, you know, what is the relationship between, you know, the human brain and consciousness? And, uh, you know, so there's two sort of quick answers to that. Is that uh, one is about one-fourth of the human brain is actually has the hardwired machinery in it to let us have a spiritual experience and to interact with a god. Um, That's number one. And number two, uh, there's just, uh, I understand, you know, believe me, I understand that this is in defiance of, uh, you know, modern neuroscience and uh, what I learned in medical school and is still taught in medical school, but there's no doubt about it, is that uh, memories are probably stored outside the brain and uh, consciousness does not depend on a functioning brain. Okay, so, but there still is a question that's left, you know, that's left, is how do we know, though, that the experiences that these children have are real? I mean, they're saying that they see a real God. They're saying this out of the other. But is the information that they get out of the experience, can that information be relied on or, or trusted? So in other words, if an angel comes and says something to you and tells you something, 
you know, can, you know, is that useful information or is that just a reflection of your own internal state? Well, that's a very, very important uh, question, particularly if you're a grieving parent. Because if uh, my child has died uh, and then I have the experience that my child has appeared at my bedside and is saying, stop crying, Mommy, I'm in heaven, well, we want to know, is that a true perception? Is that a child who really is in whatever, you know, the heck heaven is? Or <laughs> is that just a reflection of a grieving parent's internal state? So it was to answer that question that my wife and I learned uh, controlled remote viewing was because we wanted to know then is if if when we you know slip into if we delve into this 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 realm of you know of universal knowledge a realm by the way that the theoretical physicists tell us is real. I mean, our current mathematical model of reality, quantum physics, for the last 75 years, says that there is a all-knowledge, timeless, mm -hmm. baseless domain. Um, and then, like I said, there's we have all the, uh, we've got about a half of our, well, not half, a fourth of our brain has the neurological machinery to have, uh, to interact with this experience. And dead brains seem to interact with this experience. But nevertheless, sure, it's such an overwhelming concept and it's so in defiance of what we currently believe that, you know, that that doesn't, you know, all of those sort of circumstantial clues don't seem to be enough. So my wife and mm. I, we wanted to see if it was true. Is it, you know, because controlled remote viewing in itself, <laughs> the, 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 the scientific literature documenting that controlled remote viewing is real, uh, I wouldn't say it's well accepted um, by the, you know, uh, it, it, you know, I don't want to go into it. I mean, that's a whole show and you've already done, you know, I mean, but, but I'll just say that, that my wife and I decided the only way we're going to be able to sift through all this confusing and conflicting information on remote viewing is just to learn it ourselves. So uh, I've been down to, uh, you know, uh, Paul Smith, uh, you know, I've taken his course, I've taken Lynn Buchanan's course, and we spent the last couple of years, uh, and sure enough, yes, remote viewing is real. Um, and so uh, to me then, if remote viewing is real, then uh, there's no reason to believe that all of it isn't real. If I can slip into this God's mind, you know, whatever God is, uh, if I can slip into this world of universal knowledge and I can come out with uh, information that can then be objectively verified, you know, I mean, as you know, and uh, the listeners are listening now, I'll just tell you, um, what is controlled remote viewing? Well, we're just given a number, gang, a number. Uh, I did uh, my homework for Paul Smith's class last night. Um, we're just given an eight-digit number. That's it. That's all we know about the target. And an hour later, my wife and I have a perfect drawing of Devil's Tower and a perfect description of Devil's Tower. And then, sure enough, uh, you know, we get our homework, you know, uh, target back, and sure enough, it's Devil's Tower. Well, mm. I mean, that's not, you know, if there's, I mean, think about it, there's a, you know, a, you know a, a million potential targets in the world. It could have been a waterfall, it could have been a, a jet plane, it could have been anything. So if mm. we're able to do that, to me, uh, you know, then you just, you know, you've got to give up your skepticism at some point. Then you've got that's to say, true. hey, wait a minute, okay, all righty, then there is some sort of universal mind that we're contacting. And what do they say with the near-death experience? One of the most beautiful near-death experiences that I know of is this uh, woman, and she describes very vividly, uh, she almost died uh, the, during um, when she was giving birth, and she describes the experience of losing the universal knowledge. She, says, she said, I wept, I cried, because I suddenly realized that everything that I had learned, everything I knew, I was, I was losing it. And when I got back in my body, I wondered who was born. Was it me or was it was it the baby? Because right. I felt I had to start all over again. So now, yeah, so that's 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 what. So control remote viewing. It's not the near death experience, you know. It's not you know. But what it is mm -hmm. to me is it's 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 hard evidence that that what you experience during the near death experience is real. It's a window into the near death experience. 
Okay, but yeah, we're just coming out because... with information about Devil's Tower. <laughs> we're not there. Mm-hmm. Well, we've done some. I mean, we've done some interesting. Well, here I'll just uh, uh, you know just uh, just tell you I had the uh, Denver uh, Remote Viewing Club. You know, again, we just give them a number. That's all they get. They get a number, and they accurately remote viewed. Um, Crystal Merslock's uh, near-death experience. You know the girl that uh, I first uh, studied. They and they detail for detail, blow for blow. They described uh, exactly what happened to her. And you know they, that to me was unusual because you know giving somebody a near-death experience for a remote viewing target is a uh, you know I've never even heard of that before. So and yet that's what they came up with. So what you're saying is is that you you're actually I, I was a little confused. So when when you're it, Comparing the two, you're you're comparing the fact that that you are able to reach almost a god state uh, realm of consciousness of all knowing, not necessarily the the all encompassing warmth and love feeling. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. You you've nailed it. Yeah, that's exactly it. You enter into this state, but it's not. You know, I mean, with you know remote viewing, I mean, you're you're fully conscious, and you know, you're not right. There's not you know there's not angels there. It's not you know well, we're not dead. You know, we're just. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's um, now um, my associates. Uh, we, uh, you know, we're, we're working. On, you know, as I told you, on medical applications. So we're all learning to remote view. My associates have gotten to the point where they can leave their physical body and explore, you know, other realms. But again, wow. it's not. It's nothing like the near-death experience, though. I mean, you know, the um, we uh, we remote viewed. Uh, you know, they, we're all. You know, these are all just training targets to learn what we're doing. And my associate remote viewed uh, the Hindenburg. Um, and I mean, there is. I mean, he he went all over the Hindenburg. I mean, he he sort of. You know, he got so deep into the experience that he detached from. You know, from this physical reality. And uh, it was so astonishing to him that uh, he spent the last uh, three or four weeks just poring over old records of the Hindenburg and you know and of and you know of those uh, you know of those uh, airships and you mm-hmm. know just realizing to his amazement that he actually had been you know I mean you know all kinds of stuff that you know that. You know, people always wonder: Is this, you know, are these little chance fragments of memory in our mind, etc.? But you know, none of us, you know, know how the Hindenburg actually attached to its mooring posts, or you know, what the internal workings are right, like, right. or anything like that. And you know, so we have we have achieved that state, uh, um, but still, that's a far cry from the near death experience. And the near death experience, you know, is this. You know, being you know, just just let me ask you. Love. Yeah. Let me ask you. Uh, when you're talking about the remote viewing and uh, you're assimilating, uh, I mean, I guess wonderful actually getting people to study the the or but beyond looking at the Hindenburg, they're actually doing the medical stuff or gearing toward that direction. Uh, but that that gives pause to one of these questions: is uh, where does reincarnation fit into this? Are we reborn several times over, or are we just born once? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I think you know, I think that there's a we really have a whole new understanding of reincarnation now. I never understood reincarnation before. I, I to me, reincarnation used to be nonsensical. Um, is uh, you know that uh, because you know if you're born, well then how could you know there's no DNA coming from the other person. <laughs> you know the person that you were is not coming to mm-hmm. your body. So, you know, I always, you know, but once we understand that consciousness is forever, that consciousness comes first, well, then you're just going through brain after brain after brain. That is you know, that, I mean, it's that. a different way of looking at it. You, that we, you know, we're here to learn lessons of love. So, uh, that's that to me is a scientific statement. I'm, you know, I'm not ashamed of saying it because I'm not a spiritual person, but it's just there's no doubt about it. Um, and we're here. You know, our consciousness is meant to be in this physical reality, and our brain uh, is, you know, is sort of the vehicle. The, the, you know, is, is the filter, if you will. Uh, that allows us to interact in this reality. And that's why people that have had near death experiences are not all that interested in leaving their body, you know. Uh you know, they're not interested in remote viewing. <laughs> they're interested in they they know they're supposed to be right here. They're supposed to be, 
you know, that's why that's why you know we're in this consciousness. And, um, so you would say the I, brain is act. Uh, the brain is actually a, a the physical. It's almost the 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 antenna for the mind to to break into the physical realm. Then, yeah, perfectly said. Yeah, that's it in a nutshell. And 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 this is not. You know, you asked me earlier before. You said, you know, how much of my thinking has evolved? My thinking has evolved. You know, obviously light years from when I trained at Johns Hopkins. But medicine is in fact coming to this point of view as well. And, uh, I'll, you know, uh, there's a guy, his name is Robert Lanza, and he's arguably one of the world's smartest uh, physicians. He's done most of the cloning uh, studies and cloning research, um, and it's, it's L-A-N-Z-A, if people want to look him up. Uh, Robert Lanza uh, has also come to the same conclusion. And uh, I was reading his website uh, about uh, you know, a few months ago, and he talks about that the brain uh, reboots consciousness. You know that that when we get a new <laughs> when we get a new brain, we just sort of reboot our consciousness again. But that's kind of a good way to look at it. I mean, that's not uh, that's not a bad way to look mm. at it at all. That, uh, no, it's not know, at all. You know that, uh, and that we just sort of go through brain after brain after brain. I don't think. Wait, I don't see. You can't really hear, okay, let me just, you know, because your question was about reincarnation, but, uh, you know, people, you know, reincarnation sounds like a religious belief. It's not anymore. Reincarnation to me is a scientific concept, but you have to then understand the science and how it would apply. So here's, you know, um, the the hottest thing in neuroscience right now is something called functional neurogenesis. So functional just means it has to do with the way we as human beings, you know, function, interact. And neurogenesis means the growing of new brain cells. Well, it turns out in the last 10 years that the brain grows new brain cells in response to our experiences. And in mm-hmm. fact, stroke victims, they can lose huge hunks of their brain and yet they can regrow normal brain cells. Well, the only way that could happen would be if there was some source of consciousness and some source of, you know, the underlying pattern (laughs) existing outside of the functional brain. I mean, you know, but, you know, if you got a neuroscientist on your show, you would have to be pretty pointed with him or her You'd have to ask them the right questions. You know, they themselves are not quite ready to acknowledge this. But uh, mm-hmm. nevertheless, I, I don't know what's what? wrong with them. You know, theoretical physicists, they're all writing books on the philosophy of quantum physics. But we're not seeing that yet from the neuroscientists. <laughs> no, no. You know, there actually, we had a, a, a psychiatrist who was in the uh, neuroscience studies. Uh, well, she was a neuroscientist. Uh, Diane Hennessy Powell that wrote a book called uh, The ESP Enigma. We had her on. Um, I don't know if you've ever uh, studied her work. No, I, she, she, I want to get that book. It's called The ESP Enigma? I'm right Diane on. Hennessy Powell, yes. Uh, she, she she came on our show and, and really kind of blew me away because of what you're saying right now is that there are so few of them out there that are, are investigating it, yet she did um, and is yeah. doing it. So let me ask you uh, two questions. One, some people report not seeing, you know, the near-death experience occurs, they come back and they say nothing happened. What is that? Is, is that just they don't well, remember, sure. they don't want them? Well, um, we Go looked ahead. at that issue very systematically. Um, the, uh, most of it is because they were given medications. It caused them to forget the experience. Uh, that's wow. one of the reasons that we have such a high percentage um, of near-death experiences in our, our children we studied. Uh, in our formal study, we studied 26 children, and 24 of them had, you know, reported a near-death experience. But these types of uh, amnestic drugs, you know, high doses of, uh, you know, basically, you know, Valium-like drugs, are typically not used in children, um, in, hmm. whereas in adults, uh, they're just routinely given, you know, as part of the resuscitative process. Um you wow. Know, they, uh, I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, it, it's mostly just habit. It's not, I mean, nobody's sitting there saying, I want to suppress their near death experience because most physicians don't think they're having I was about to ask you that. But no, it's, it's more just that, um, 
it, it's extremely painful uh, to be intubated and mechanically ventilated. Uh, there's um, many cases of uh, patients, you know, who are in the operating room and they weren't given heavy enough of these doses, and so they had the horrifying experience of being awake, you know, during their entire operation. Um, you know, so uh, just as a result of that sort of thing, it's just sort of a reflex with, uh, you know, particularly with anesthesiologists, they're going to give uh, high doses of these medicines. And, and we showed very nicely that, you know, the fewer drugs uh, that patients have on board, the more likely they are to have, um, you know, these types of experiences. So I think that's the first thing is they just forget it. I think the second thing is that the experience itself unfolds in a very systematic way. So, for example, uh, we looked at the length of cardiac arrest versus uh, the actual uh, nature of the experience. Uh, you know, um, so patients that had these very long, evolved, down the tunnel into a light, had experiences in heaven, uh, they were often, you know, anywhere from uh, 18 to 45 minutes in which they were uh, you know, being uh, resuscitated, uh, whereas uh, many patients have just a very brief cardiac arrest, uh, you know, just one or two seconds. And so they may just have complete darkness, you know, which is the cessation of, you know, the ordinary perception. They may be mm -hmm. conscious uh, but uh, just have darkness. And by and large, then they don't think they had any experience. And, now, uh, you know, so, you know, that's, well, you asked me to tell you stories. i got to tell you You're doing a great now. job of it. Because there's another part to this. When I hear people tell me that they haven't had a near-death experience, very often it's because they don't realize that what happened to them was a near-death experience. Because, see, you know, we've all gotten sort of conditioned to think, oh, it's floating out of the body, down the tunnel, and into the light. Well, Raymond Moody, who... Um, who, who sort of, you know, popularized that concept. If you read his book, he says he says that this is just a, uh, a hypothetical uh, construct, that he never actually met one patient that had that whole sequence. So I'm going to tell you a story. Was, uh, I was on a radio show just like this, and um, the host told me. Uh, he said, well, I nearly died, and I didn't have a near-death experience, so how do you explain that? So I said to him, well, tell me what happened, you know. And, you know, I want to hear the whole story because, you know, sometimes people overlook little elements that, you know, might tell. So he says, well, I was uh, in a car and um, my, uh, we were asleep in the back and uh, my friend uh, was in the front seat and he was drunk and he was driving too fast. And he says, uh, and so I suddenly saw that he was uh, driving like 70, 80, and then, you know, I saw the uh, speedometer just going, you know, 90 miles an hour. And uh, he, he said, and that's really all I remember. And I said to him, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so you were in the back of the car. <laughs> you just told me you were in the back of the car and you were asleep and you were lying back there. And now you're suddenly saying that you saw the, the uh, speedometer and you saw how fast huh. the car was going. And right hmm. then he goes, oh, my God, you're right. I'm wow. out of my body. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's just a lot of times people just don't, you know, and then and you know, and then all kinds of other you know memories just flooded right in. But it's just you know, you just have to keep that in mind. That, you know that uh, you know it's like, well, it's like a little child once told me that her near death experiences was these doctors talking to her, and I said, well, how did you know they were doctors? She said they were fourteen feet tall and they had light bulbs in their bodies. Well, if I hadn't asked her, you know, what was a doctor, you know, that could have just, you know, that could have just sort of just been, oh, well, so she didn't have an experience, just doctors were talking to her. <laughs> so, wow. you know, there's, just, there's a lot to it. When I hear people say they, you know, and then also, you know, how, you know, the ordinary person, I don't think they really know if they're near death or not. I mean, the average, well, when I worked in the ICU, our, you know, here's what, here's what our watchword was. The patient that we think is the healthiest is the patient most likely to die tonight. <laughs> and the wow. patient that's most critically ill is the patient that will probably still be here tomorrow. Because it's very mm. hard to sort all that out, you know. I mean, that's why I was telling you before, I'm just so, I'm so grateful. I have such an obligation that these are patients that are resuscitated myself. You know, I personally know what their state of their medical uh, condition was. 
you can't get that from reading a chart. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that's 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 my answer to that. Tell me about we. You know, I, I've read. I, I, I talked to Paul Smith and, and I've talked to Diane Hennessy Powell and they're saying the, the pineal gland is is the God spot. But I don't I didn't really read that you were saying it's the only the pineal gland. And I and I also know that one of your colleagues that you uh, disagree with but uh, have somewhat been receptive to his work is I believe a Dr. Uh, Beauregard. Is, is that yeah. or not? Yeah. Uh, can you explain to us uh, potentially even walk us through where to put our hand on our head to so we can know where the God spot is and what it is exactly. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. I can't comment on what Dr. Powell had to say. Uh, so because, but I, I wish she was on the show so I could talk to her. Because, uh, um, but anyway, so uh, let's. But you know, I mean, Paul Smith is, you know, he's a great guy, but you know, he's a, you know, he's an army sergeant. I mean, he's not a, you know, well, he's got a PhD in philosophy. But um, anyway, the pineal gland throughout the ages, has always been sort of mystically thought to have something to do with the seat of our soul. So, you know, if you read, you know, the ancient, uh, you know, anatomists and philosophers and, you know, just to, and And there, I think there's good reason for that, is that it's uh, located uh, sort of it's above uh, the brain stem, which is, you know, right above, you know, the neck, and it's sort of a nice round little shape. And uh, so I think, you know, people just sort of assume that, you know, that's sort of the seat of the soul. And, uh, you know, there, there, is, uh, there are interesting things about the pineal gland. Uh, the pineal gland has a lot of uh, magnetic uh, properties. Um, there's uh, some interesting work on spirit possession and things like that that involve the pineal gland. But really, uh, you know, uh, for the purposes of your question, I think the pineal gland it really has nothing to do with being the God spot. <laughs> I mean, to be blunt. Wow. That that's just, you know, that that's just, you know, that's just, you know, that's just sort of picking up on, you know, uh, you know, throughout history. And, yeah, I mean, but not, you know. But with the dawn of medical history, with the dawn of medical history, going back over 100 years, you know, when people actually tried to figure out, hey, what does this brain do and how does it work? Um, it's been noted that the right side of the brain, in the deepest areas, so if you can imagine just right where your ear is, and then just, you know, in about, you know, three inches or so, in the very deepest area, is called your uh, hippocampus and your temporal lobe. And it's on the right-hand side. Um, and there's an important reason for that. You know, we've now learned that we have two states of consciousness one roughly corresponding to the right hemisphere and one roughly corresponding to the left hemisphere. Um, And so this right temporal lobe uh, has been uh, for a long, long time, about 100 years, associated with spiritual experiences in a wide variety of different ways. Um, It's been noted that people who have seizures of that area have seizures of seeing God. Well, so if you have a seizure in your motor cortex, you know, if you have a seizure, you know, in the area that makes your leg move, well, then your leg will move all the time. Mm-hmm. So if you have a seizure in your right temporal lobe, then, um, uh, you know, then uh, you'll have this repeated experience of seeing God. So that's, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, Dostoevsky was, uh, you know, the Russian writer, uh, had right temporal lobe seizures and frequently saw God. All right, so um, then coming up to about the, uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, Wilder Penfield, who's the father of uh, modern uh, neurosurgery, he actually took probes and he electrically stimulated the brain (laughs) in the good old days of surgery (laughs) when, you know, Mm. you didn't need informed consent and (laughs) and, and, and these nosy, you know, these nosy, uh, you know, human subject review committees. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so he, so but but so he mapped out, you know, most of what we know about the brain, uh, you know, at least up until modern times. I mean, the you know current modern times, he would, you know, so he stimulate, you know, your arm moving area of the brain, and person would move their arm. He stimulated the leg, and so you know, so he mapped out all the different areas of the brain. And when he stimulated these areas in the hippocampus and in the right temporal lobe, people said stuff like, "Oh God, I'm leaving my body." 
Or they would say, wow. even more fascinating, I'm half in and I'm half out. Huh. So you know that's uh, that's so that's really um, where uh, the situation uh, uh, comes uh, right on up to modern times. So uh, my you know since you know I learned about near death experiences and uh, you know and this sort of thing, um, my only contribution you know my only contribution to this was to just make the the suggestion. Hey, wait a minute, maybe this isn't a hallucination. Maybe this isn't, uh, you know, maybe they're actually contacting a real God. I mean, why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, for the first hundred years of this sort of research, everybody just sort of dismissed it. But it didn't ever make sense to me because why would, you know, 25% of our brain be dedicated to allowing us to perceive a God, uh, you know, whatever God is. And, and, and this, uh, this debate still continues to this modern day. So uh, Andrew Newberg, for example, um, has done very nice uh, studies of meditating nuns and such as that, and he's shown beautifully that there's a specific area of the brain that turns off when you meditate, and then other areas of the brain activate, and then ultimately the right temporal lobe um, you know, uh, is activated and people uh, see God. Well, that's the same sequence of events that happens with a near-death experience. You know, there's, uh, mm. first there's the complete cessation of input from our ordinary senses, and then, um, you know, then you're seeing God. But even wow. even today, if you read Andrew Newberg's work or if you read reviews of his work, people are still going, well, but see, if there's all this, you know, hardware in the brain that allows us to see God, then doesn't that mean that this experience is just in your head, you know, that they're not seeing a real God. Um, and also, I propose this concept of the God spot. Um, you know, Dr. Beauregard, would, I have the greatest respect for him, but Dr. Beauregard sort of forgets <laughs> that I proposed this, this idea almost 20 years ago. <laughs> and so at the time that I proposed it, everybody else was saying, this is just a hallucination, you know, and so so I'm mm-hmm. stepping forward. I'm saying, hey, wait a minute. No, it's not a hallucination. We have a God spot. It allows us to connect to a God. Because Dr. Mm-hmm. Beauregard, his objection is that I didn't go far enough. He says, wait a minute. It's not just a spot, but that in fact, you know, there's multiple areas of the brain that allow us to have the spiritual experience. And so, you know, it's, when he says there's no God spot, that's what he's trying to say. He's trying to say it's not just a God spot, but that it's a larger, you know, uh, more generalized phenomena that we have. In fact, what he calls his book, The Spiritual Brain, that our brain itself is rigged to interact uh, with, you know, with, with God. I mean, whatever, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't want to pretend I'm, I don't want to get into what God is, I, you know. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, don't, I had somebody angrily tell me, "I don't believe in God. I believe in a higher power." You know, uh, you know. To me, okay. God is what children tell me, right? Yeah, you know, they they say they saw God, and I say, "What is God?" Well, he had a happy face for me. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't want to get into a lot, but you see what I'm saying. So, you know, it's, we're sort of at a weird. Uh, you know, I I'm trying to do something a little bit different in that. I'm trying to change the mass cultural point of view. So when I say there's a God spot, I'm talking to people who, well, like people like Matthew Alpert or people like Michael Shermer uh, who go, oh, look, there's a God spot. See, that proves that it's mm-hmm. just in your brain. <laughs> As if, you know, that, that's what they're saying, and I'm saying no. You know, but if, one of if we come across a TV set, you know, there must be a TV transmitter somewhere. You, you've but, got, like, um, I, you know, I, I read I, one of your yeah. accounts where, where the little girl, when you brought her back, she said that she was told to come back to help her mom with her brother. I mean, it, that right there, if you, do you know the story I'm talking about? Because that oh, right yeah. there proves that there is, there's precognition, that it's beyond just the yeah. mind. When, cause, will, you, will you tell us that story? Oh, yeah. And then she draws a picture. And her picture is of her brother with a gigantic heart in his chest. Um, she uh, she draws a picture, uh, you know, she's in the sort of heavenly realm, and she says, I brought back to help my brother. <laughs> and, and then she draws a picture, 
and uh, he has a, uh, you know, and, and she, you know, these are these very schematic pictures that children draw, but she draws this gigantic red heart in his chest. And sure enough, he was born with, uh, you know, uh, a heart defect that caused his heart to almost fill his entire chest. And, uh, you know, of course, at mm. the time that she was resuscitated, it wasn't even known that, uh, you know, that the mother was pregnant. And even if, let's say, somebody did have an inkling that the mom was pregnant, you know, who would, who would, you know, who could possibly have uh, predicted that the child would be, you know, born with a, you know, with a heart disease? That's not, you know, you know, coincidence. You know, coincidences are the refuge of the lazy mind. <laughs> they're not, uh, you know, <laughs> often used to explain these types of experiences. But uh, come on, that's not a coincidence. It's, you know, she actually saw something that was real. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and there's, I mean, just you know, just case after case after case of that. You know, that they're they're getting real information from this. They're, uh, uh, you know, they're they're experiencing something that's real. So our God spot connects us, you know, to this greater reality, and it makes sense because if you if you have the concept of a God spot, well, then you can understand. And you know, what else do we use this? You know, we'll use during prayer, during our ordinary lives. It's during, you know, it mediates spiritual experiences. I mean, over 50% of grieving parents will have a very vivid spiritual experience of their child returning to them, um, you know, and trying to reassure them. And, you know, like I said, you know, that's, you know, that's, you know, been my greatest motivation is to try to sort out for them. Is that just a byproduct of their grieving mind? Well, if we have a God spot, if we have 25% of our brain dedicated to have spiritual experiences, it's hard to see how we would have evolved that, you know, just to, to give us a hallucinatory experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, you know, so that's, I mean, that. so I hope that explains, you know, why, you know, Mar- it's not just Mario Beauregard. I've got another a good friend, his name is Julio Perez, and he also is very, you know, he just, you know, he's very, you know, if anything, my, my uh, work upsets him. Because he's very, it's not a God spot, you know. It's the whole brain. It's the whole brain. When you say it's a God spot, you know, you're, you know, you're trivializing it. Well, I don't know. You know, I, you know, I, you know, our our levels of understanding have to proceed. And I think that, you know, the whole brain is, a, you know, that's a, a more advanced concept. But I think most people relate to the idea that we have a God spot uh, that, you know, allows us to connect to a greater reality. And that that's what we're mm-hmm. doing when, uh, when we pray, when we have spiritual visions, when we meditate, uh, and we're going to all have the experience when we die. Do in in these near death experiences, uh, the people that come back, do they report uh, seeing relatives, or, or uh, is are they angels? Do they or do they have experiences where they don't report anyone? But in the, I guess they have all of that. But but is it common yeah. for a deceased relative to greet them? Oh, absolutely. So uh, the greeter is one of the most important parts of it, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing, that uh, when we die, uh, somebody helps us with the transition. We don't die alone. Uh, there's, you know, we don't. Uh, that uh, Somebody helps us with this transition. And it, it, whatever this comes, it comes in a form that we can understand. So, you know, that's why you, you've got to just, you just, you just got to buck up and start understanding that these experiences are real. Because one of the confusing things that people have is they go, well, how come this person said they had this experience and that person said they had that experience? You know, you know, is this, is this you know, I mean, doesn't that just mean that the mind is just making it up? Um, no, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it means that we all understand spiritual experiences in a way, you know, that we can relate to it that you know there's if my wife dies before me i am certain that i will see my wife when i die but you're not going to see my wife when when you die <laughs> you know uh, you're going to see you know something that's important to you and we show this very nicely uh yeah well well yeah that could be actually um i was just about to say in children uh it's very common for them uh, to see dogs uh, it's very common for children to see dogs. Uh, very common for them. Uh, one child told me that she saw a lamb, and uh, she was uh, told, uh, 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 you know, I asked, well, what is this lamb? And she had a lamby when she was two years old. 
um, the, you know, that was her comfort object. Um, the the experience itself is is so vividly real that uh, one one girl said to me, uh, she said, well, nobody was there uh, when I nearly died, but one of your nurses sat by me. One of the nurses sat by me and held my hand uh, while you uh-huh. guys were, you know, while we were doing the resuscitation. I said, oh, that's really interesting. And she said, oh, yeah, it was so nice of her. And she said, she just sat there and she just held held my hand and she just smiled and told me everything is going to be all right. <laughs> and this is, she was a teenage girl. And she wow. sort of made it sound like this was some sort of pleasant, uh, uh, you know, just sort of a, like a probably a volunteer that the hospital had, that, you know, came up and held people's hands during their resuscitations. That's beautiful. <laughs> but, you know, it really is. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's nobody there uh, like that, right? You know, so it's just, but the fact that there's so many different, you know, since it comes to people in so many different ways. You've got to go back to that initial understanding, hey, wait a minute, we shouldn't be having any experience at all. <laughs> you know, that's why the first, you know, the first research that I did was when does the experience occur? If the experience is just an invention of the mind after the fact, well, then, of course, you know, we're just inventing stuff that, you know, makes us feel good. But, in fact, the near-death experience occurs in the last few minutes of life. And so, you know, once you understand that fact, once you completely comprehend that, well, then you understand why, you know, we went to Africa, we studied 50 African near-death experiences. They're nothing at all like American experiences, except they're conscious, they're aware, and they're learning lessons of love in the last few minutes of life. Mm. We, I, I sent, I didn't go, I sent my research assistant to Japan she studied 400 Japanese near-death experiences. The exact same thing. You know, the imagery was completely different. But awake, aware, and learning lessons of love. Let me ask you this question. And it's going to come to you away. Well, yeah. Go on. I'm sorry. Um, well, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt you. Uh, oh, I just had that one little fragment. I was just going to say that, you know, we die the life we live. That, that it's going to come to you in a way you can understand. We don't die alone. We die with someone who helps us with the transition. Okay, I I just my question that I was going to ask you just left. I do you do any work with like oh, hospice? Right. Yeah. Wow. Uh hospice work to me is extremely important because this I would find you comforting. Oh, thank you. That's a, uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 there's you know, here's you know, since you say that, uh, you know, you know, I get a million letters, uh, and but um, well, nowadays I get email. <laughs> but you know, back in the day, some people wrote letters. <laughs> I got, you know, I got so many letters. And here's a common pattern to these letters that really just meant a lot to me. Is a lot of times people would say they'd say, you know, something. I, you know, I'm not sure that I believe in heaven, and I understand your research doesn't prove there's an afterlife, because I'm not. It, really doesn't. I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, it sort of tangentially does, but, uh, you know, but they would say, but you, you know, you told me, you know, you, you know, you, you let me see that my child's last few minutes of life were not painful. That, you know, when, when I saw you, you know, doing all those terrible things and sticking all those needles and, you know, all the terrible things that you're doing, you know, and that, that when my, when my son looked at me and he said, you know, mommy, you know, the white horse is here. Now I know what that meant, you know, that that wasn't just some sort of stray hallucination. That wasn't just some sort of mental fragment that, you know, that I'm now assigning meaning to, but I now know, you know, that, you know, in our religion, you know, the white horse, you know, means that he's going to be going to God. And, uh, you know, now, you know, thank you for letting me know what that means. And that means a lot to me. Because that, I think that's the most, uh, well, you know, it's all solid, but that's, you know, very, uh, I don't see any way of getting around it. Uh, you know, that's, the, you know, the rock, hard, core reality of the near-death experience is we're awake, we're aware when we die, and the dying process is is, is pleasant. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> well, I'm not looking forward to it, but, <laughs> you know, it's certainly not to be feared. It's, it's inevitable, though, so, yeah. yeah. Um, there's no getting around. I mean, there's, right. There's, <laughs> you, you, we're all going to die, but 
you know, and, and just, uh, anybody who's listening has a fear of death, though. <laughs> I have to tell you <laughs> what Jesse Elon told me. She, I said to her, because, uh, you know, we, you know, did this follow-up study. I said, so, you know, do you, are you afraid of dying? She said, oh, no. She said, now I know a little bit more about it. <laughs> wow. You know, so, you know, it's, you know I, I don't see this. I'm not, I'm not afraid to die, but. Of course, I've had the experience of children patting me on the hand and saying, don't worry, Dr. Moore's heaven is fun. That's incredible. <laughs> that, sort of, that sort of takes away, uh, you know. You know a little bit of an edge. You asked me at the start of this show, you were asking me, well, you know, I mean, you can see it's just sort of, easy, you know, it's, it's like it's like water on the, on the rocks. You know, I started off just, you know, sort of, you know, come on, when you die, you die. I definitely was the callous. Uh, emergency room, uh, you know, critical care physician you're talking about. And, you know, after a while, you just, you know, when they pat you on the wrist. And, because, I mean, she was seeing that part of me. You know, she was seeing me like, you know, sort of almost giggling, at, you know, what she's telling me. And she's like, oh, you'll see Dr. Morris having this fun. Don't you worry. <laughs> hmm. You know, it's a, you, know it, it's, you can't help but be moved by it. Mm-hmm. Now, have there ever been any kind of studies where, and I, I I know this would be few and far between, but uh, one of our forum members wants to know, his name is Nemesis 2012. His question basically is, uh, when when you're dying and you start gaining access to, to this all-encompassing consciousness or the God spot, uh, has anyone ever monitored the brain on the whole to see if everything uh, is lighting up at, you know, with that, consciousness coming in or becoming more apparent? It, it, has there been any tests or, or studies done on the actual uh, view or, or the actual uh, presentation of the brain uh, information at that point in time? The, um, I'm going to learn more about that because apparently that research has just come out this year and I, I have not seen the research myself. Um, this 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 will be my way of bragging to you, <laughs> to just slip in a little plug for myself. Um, All right. We did a study of uh, we did a study of remote viewing, in which we wanted to see could we successfully remote view viruses in plants, and we did that for a very important reason. The virus that we are attempting to remote view uh, is uh, virtually identical to the human AIDS virus. And so, you know, we felt, you know, but we thought we would see if we could, and, and our viewers can, um, to a highly, uh, we're not good enough yet that we could use it clinically. I have one viewer who's about 90% accurate. The other viewers are in the 60 to 70% range, but nevertheless, a highly statistically significant, you know, because by chance, you know, they're going to be 50% accurate. And, and, and we have thousands of trials. I mean, it's not, this isn't, you know, we have thousands of trials now. And so our uh, research uh, has been accepted uh, for presentation in uh, the uh, International Consciousness uh, um, uh, Conference in Sweden, which is, you know, arguably the, you know, the top consciousness uh, uh, conference uh, in the world each year. And at that, I just was looking through, you know, who else was presenting there. And uh, I briefly mentioned this earlier. Uh, there is a group that's going to be presenting their um, uh, research, just what the caller's question was, that apparently there is uh, some very coherent brain activity right at the point of death. But I honestly don't know any more than that. Uh, I'm not aware that they've published, uh, and I'm just, you know, uh, I'm really uh, anxious to, uh, you know, to hear what they have to say. Because think about it. We don't really, you know, dying patients... I mean, you know, it might, you know, <laughs> I, I, I well understand the, the uh, you know, the person's question, but you you got to understand the realities of the modern hospital. I, I can't even imagine uh, how you could get something through a human subjects review board. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm, well, mm-hmm. let's see, I want to do, I want to do brain scans on dying patients. That's going to be, I mean, that's going to just be, you know, just a, 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 a uh, mm-hmm. You know, a no go. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm really fascinated to see that part of it. Uh, I mean, that's why we remote viewed viruses and plants because we knew we've got to build up a pretty solid uh, uh, framework before we could even approach a human subjects review board. And, and this is just for remote viewing people. I mean, that's 
you know, nobody's going to argue that hurts anybody in any way. But, um, you know, doing research in hospitals on human subjects is very, very difficult. Oh, 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 unless you're a big drug company and you have Absolutely. another yet, yet the tenth version of uh, an antidepressant pill. <laughs> Uh, just that little That's bit. so true. <laughs> okay, well, we're down okay. to. You know, we t- wait, wait, wait. I gotta get this off my chest because we talked Please. about this from, you know, we talked about this at the beginning of the show. You know, so I want people to understand. You know, I went through a lot of information in a quick way, but but you're gonna see we keep coming back to it again and again. You asked me how does this change my view of medicine? Well, if the lessons that we learn from the near death experience. If that was a pill, we would be selling them by the truckload. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, that would be, you know, you look at the top ten uh, medications prescribed worldwide. Over half of them are antidepressants, anti-anxiety. You know, they're for mental states of mind. Mm-hmm, and yet, mm-hmm. uh, the near-death experience clearly teaches us that we don't have to be afraid of dying. That our lives are filled with purpose and meaning. Um, you know, I mean, that, you know, uh, uh, serotonin uptake inhibitors. Serotonin is sort of our molecule of meaning. That's why, you know, so people wouldn't have to take a pill uh, to have a sense of meaning. And yet, uh, nobody. I mean, that's not controversial. That the top six, seven drugs prescribed worldwide are drugs designed to relieve anxiety and promote meaning. And yet, um, you know, the near death experience. I, I once, uh, you know, tried to apply for a grant and uh, for uh, permission to just study and talk about spirituality with dying uh, patients, and uh, you would have thought that, you know, I took a dump, you know, on the, you know, on the front lawn of the hospital. I mean, you know, so it's just, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just infuriating that that, that oh, we so trivialize the spirit, and yet we're so willing to prescribe a medication. For people who don't feel spiritually connected. Okay, well, I won't let you talk about spirituality, but here, take a pill, and you won't find that you're worried about it anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, this is, you know, it's a far cry. I agree. It's a far cry from being a critical care physician. I used to just, my life was, can I thread a tiny little, you know, catheter into a teeny tiny little vein? You know, I lived for that. That was Wow, you know, what could be better in life than that? <laughs> well, you know, sure, I guess I'm a little different now. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, we're down to three minutes left. Um, I had some questions I want to ask you, but we didn't get to them. And, and so that begs the, the biggest question of all. Um, I want you back on the show in the near future. So, um, sure, I'm, I'm I'd be happy to. This is, beautiful. What a great conversation this has been. This is one of the best interviews I've had. I, I didn't get through half of my questions because they were, they were – I, 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 yeah, we're going to have to have you on in the near future. Um, will you go ahead and, and you told us what you're kind of working on. Uh, will you plug your site, plug your books? Uh, we've got, oh, we only have two minutes left. Um, and no, tell us, I'm if you can, how to get my involved. Charity. Listen charity. up, everybody. If Please. I did anything for you guys, if you learned anything, go to firstgiving.com. It's um and it's uh for uh it's for the Special Olympics. Just put in my name is uh you know is Melvin Morse, and it's uh you know it's one of these uh, charity sites. Uh, it's uh, for the Special Olympics. That's what um you know that, that's uh, that's uh, uh, uh you know I've got a fundraiser right now uh, to get uh to raise money for the Special Olympics. It's a pleasure to talk with you. I was I was. Going over your websites today, and you've got some phenomenal uh, research and and investigations into near death experiences. Can can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in this? Sure. Um, I was a critical care physician uh, for the first part of my career, and uh, I was at the, out of uh, Seattle Children's Hospital. Uh, I worked for. Um, uh, it's known as Airlift Northwest, and Airlift Northwest is, you know, as, as you might imagine, is an air transport service uh, through, you know, Alaska, uh, Montana, Idaho, uh, Oregon, and to bring critically ill children to Seattle Children's Hospital. So I happened to uh, pick up a young girl uh, in uh, Pocatello, Idaho, and 
she was a very, very difficult resuscitation. Um, and, uh, several times I thought that uh, she was, uh, in fact, dead. Uh, and her, uh, her parents, in fact, had uh, insisted on uh, coming in and uh, praying uh, at her bedside and forming sort of a prayer ring around her, which was uh, very inconvenient for us because, uh, of course, you know, we're trying to put all kinds of tubes and lines in her. And But uh, I figured that she was, you know, really, uh, you know, that her demise was going to be within uh, minutes, so I let them. Uh, but to my surprise, uh, she made a full recovery. And as one of these things happens in life, uh, sort of a coincidence, I happened to be uh, out there uh, in Pocatello uh, uh, working, uh, uh, doing some residency training in a uh, little clinic there, and she happened to be, uh, she came into that clinic for uh, her follow-up after her successful recovery. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, there's the guy that put a tube in my nose. <laughs> wow. And I was like, well, what? You know, because uh, when I had seen her, of course, uh, you know, she uh, wasn't seeing anything. Uh, her eyes were fixed and dilated, and uh, she, uh, you know, so, so, you know, she was so, well, we tape her eyes closed anyway in those situations because we don't want, you know, dust or dirt to fall in them. But, um, you know, I, I knew that she had not, in fact, <laughs> seen uh, me do anything. And she went on to uh, say things like, uh, oh, little comments that the nurses has made. And then she said, oh, I saw you go over to the phone, and you were talking to someone on the phone, and you were uh, you were sort of shouting at them, saying, uh, well, what am I supposed to do now? Uh, which, in fact, was what I was doing. Because um, <laughs> I sort of, you know, I didn't know, you know, what to do next in terms of her resuscitation, and uh, she gave a blow-by-blow -blow, uh, details of her own resuscitation. And mm. at the time, I was training to be a neurologist, and interestingly enough, you know, medical scientists, we don't feel good about it, but let's face it: it's that these are dead brains, and yet they're still conscious and they're awake and they're alert and they're having thoughts and feelings, and more importantly. The uh, feelings they're having are primarily spiritual feelings and the belief that they're learning lessons of love. I, mm. just, it, you, you know, you can't get around it. That's a scientific statement in the year 2011, is that when we die, we're going to be awake and aware and we're learning lessons of love. Uh, you know, so I, I, I'll, I'll, let me just... Uh, uh, I'm going to just give you, you know, to show you how solid this science is. Um, there's a guy named Jim Winery, uh, who is a very good friend of mine. Uh, I worked with him for years, and he's a flight surgeon uh, for uh, the National Warfare Institute. And uh, he inadvertently discovered an experimental model for near-death experiences. They took uh, uh, fighter pilots, and they would put them in a centrifuge and whirl them at enormous speeds so they could understand the effect of G-forces on the human brain. And so, uh, you know, of course, uh, he's able to, you know, they can vary their centrifuge runs to, you know, a couple of minutes before theoretical death, you know, right on up to a couple of seconds before theoretical death. And sure enough, his research shows that in the last few seconds of life, really when the brain theoretically should be shutting down, it's not. It's uh, the, you know, those pilots then suddenly become awake and aware, and they think they're out of their uh, body, and they're having a, a whole variety of near-death experiences. And quite frankly, yeah. this is after they've gone into coma. This is after they've had seizures. This is after they've had, you know, a complete loss of, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's you, know, see, you can't, yeah, you can't. I don't think anybody can dispute anymore that uh, in the last few minutes of life, oh, well, <laughs> they, you know, a child told me best. She said, I was never so alive. I was never so alive as in the few seconds before I died. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> Let me ask you, you, your perception of Western medicine, you, you, I, I'm reading your work. You seem like you've, you've moved away from the, the traditional constructs of Western medicine. Is that the case, or is Western medicine moving towards the research you're doing? Um, no, I, I think that um, I'm moving away from <laughs> from traditional Western medicine. Um, I, now, I want to say something though that I, you know that I think is important. In no way am I saying that you know so-called Western medicine is wrong. You know, I, I think that you know the the new 
you know, understandings that I've had, and frankly, I think anybody involved in this field has had. Uh, we're not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's. But you know, I understand the sort of skeptical viewpoint, or people that really dismiss these experiences out of hand, or are really, you know, it doesn't resonate with them. Because I had that uh, myself. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's very, very difficult because we're trained, of course, to think that the brain creates consciousness. And uh, I think one advantage that I have, these are by and large patients I resuscitated myself. So I knew for a fact that their brains weren't working. Whereas, you know, when I think when other people, when you read about these stories or, uh, you know, you just really wonder, well, were they really close to death or, you know, are they just kind of exaggerating things or, you know, or, or if you go through the medical records, it's very hard sometimes to tell if somebody's really near death or not. Whereas uh, <laughs> the boy I was telling you about, you know, I know, you know, he was in full cardiac arrest. Um, I mean, within minutes, uh, he would have been dead. That's why we resuscitated him on the lobby of the, uh, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> children's hospital <laughs> instead of now, taking him to the emergency room. When, when you say they're, they're dead, I mean, I, I, I guess a, a skeptic would say, oh, well, there, there must be some oxygen in the brain. There's still brain activity, but that's not the case. The brain is literally flatlined. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, uh, I'm going to just skip to the end of the story because, um I just think that uh, it, you know, I, I used to mince around like you like you're saying too. Uh, when, when we first published our studies, we would call them clinically dead, uh, and then we would, uh, you know, we just sort of hem and haw about it because again, it defies what we're taught. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I went to Johns Hopkins. I mean, you know, the, the the gods of neurology that I worship say that you know the coma wipes clean the slate of consciousness. You know, dead brains don't think. In other words. Mm -hmm. But here's the end of the story. I'll just skip right to the end. In the last couple of years, astonishingly enough, um, science has found that there is a resting energy in the brain that far exceeds probably the entire energy output of the brain uh, you know, uh, during you know, a conscious uh, life. And so they're, they're really, uh, in the last couple of years, it's been well shown uh, that the dying or dead brain has an enormous amount of uh, resting activity. Um, uh, physicians at uh, George Washington University uh, just recently showed uh, that in the last few seconds of life, there's an enormous amount of coherent brain wave activity measured on EEGs. So uh, I think mm. we just, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think anybody feels good about it. I mean, you know, unless you're already very religious. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, but I mean, I'm just saying the uh, spiritual aspects of her experience are really had very little interest for me. I was mostly interested that she could remember anything, that she mm -hmm. could, in fact, describe her own resuscitation. And the, How the many of these results they study this? You, you, you've documented many of these instances. It, was it something that, I mean, when when you encountered her story, did it immediately start ringing uh, bells in your head that there's something else out there? Because I, I read a story of yours where you were talking about um, joking with other doctors as as you were, uh, I believe, performing CPR on a baby or, or, or trying to resuscitate a child. And it, it didn't shock me when I read that because I've got family there in the medical field, and, and it's somewhat common that... Um, I, I guess to make a, a light of the situation or, or to make it easier to accept that a lot of medical professionals end up almost in a very callous nature um, in regards to a situation like that. I mean, it wasn't just this one event. How many do you think overall, before you start going, wait a second, there's something here? Well, it wasn't. Uh, I don't think that was really the sequence. Um, I haven't really... Uh, thought that there was something here, <laughs> as, as you put it. Uh, that took me many, many years to reach that uh, realization. Uh, that what really uh, interested me uh, first was this concept of uh, that she could retain a memory at all. And mm -hmm. so I immediately, I, I was just uh, starting uh, in medicine. I was a uh, you know, resident uh, at the time. Uh, so I was, you know, I wanted to make my mark in the world. And uh, I immediately uh, set out to uh, do a study of these experiences. And at the time, nobody had really studied these experiences in any sort of formal or systematic way. 
there was a number of uh, sort of collections of uh, stories in adults, but uh, at Seattle Children's Hospital, uh, we decided that uh, we would, uh, well, at, at the time, actually, we thought that an anesthetic agent uh, called halothane uh, caused these experiences. Uh, halothane is known to sort of cause dissociative or out-of-body experiences, and uh, we decided we would uh, study them. So we studied all survivors of cardiac arrest at Seattle Children's Hospital over about 10 years. And then uh, it's over that 10-year period, <laughs> I mean, that, uh, that it just sort of starts creeping up on you. I, 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 I resuscitated one child. Uh, it was uh, He was uh, resuscitated in the lobby of uh, Seattle Children's Hospital. He had a cardiac arrest because his pacemaker uh, failed. And so we resuscitated him right in the lobby and got his pacemaker going again. And he opens his eyes and he looks at me and he goes, that was weird. You guys just sucked me back into my body. Oh my. I'm saying, though, that, you know, that pills don't work. You know, of course they work. Um, mm. You know, of course our bodies are biological machines. Of course we can tinker with the biological machine uh, with, you know, various uh, pills and uh, things like that. But having said that, uh, it's far more limited than we ever realized that uh, so much of uh, medicine is in fact, you know, what people loosely call energetic medicine. It's really, uh, you know, the, the, you know, this idea that, um, <laughs> you know, that we're just a biological machine. Uh, it doesn't do uh, justice to what's going on uh, during the healing mm -hmm. process. I agree. I and agree. I, you know, I just we're just, you know, but it's not, uh, you know, the reason I'm emphasizing this is. It really irritates me what I consider to be an unhealthy either-or attitude. You know, either you go see a nature path or, you know, you go see your regular doctor. I mean, I dream of, you know, 20 years from now, you know, all doctors having the same body of information and using it well, the way it's supposed to be. I mean, medicine should be medicine. Uh, you know, mm, but I agree. Uh, sure. But you know, <laughs> you know, having said that, <laughs> I mean, we're we're doing a lot of uh, research now in energetic medicine, and it's amazing to me that the sort of built-in uh, prejudices against it, the built-in, you know, this sort of the sweeping and the dismissive, uh, you know, it's oh, somewhat well, dismissed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's ridiculous. Of course, it's true. Um, it's, it, you know, well, you know, this might sound like a weird jump to you, but it's not. You know, you know, so I'll fill in the gaps, but I'm going to do the jump first. Um, when I wanted to understand if the near-death experience is real, uh, so one thing that my wife and I uh, learned to do was something called uh, remote viewing. And the remote viewing uh, is the ability to use your mind to see things that are not in your ordinary field of senses. Well, so that's important to me to understand near-death experiences because the near-death experience is what we call a non-local perception. You know, these children are describing another reality that is not, in fact, this reality. Well, so the question comes, well, is that other reality real? You know, are they, is the God that they see a real God? Well, you know, and I've been on enough of these debates to know that, you know, that you always have some sort of mean-spirited <laughs> materialist guy that only, you know, it always does seem to be a guy, by the way. You know, he always Absolutely. says, well, these are just hallucinations in the last few minutes of life and blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> come on. You know. So let's see, when we die, we hallucinate we're going to heaven and we hallucinate we're learning beautiful stories of love, uh, of how we could have lived our lives differently. Uh,